As we dive back into Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, there's really two main points that I want to hit in this study. Um, the verse says this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. Okay, And so we want to understand, um, we already hit a little bit in the last video, but I want to just go a little bit further with, with Paul's meaning when he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And then we need to hit the second point which is what does Paul mean when he says he's filling up in his flesh what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church? Is he saying that there is something that's lacking in what Christ suffered for his church or not? We're going to get to it in a second. But in order to do this, um, we're going we're gonna to read the verse and then we're going to use two passages, one um, from Corinthians, one from Philippians. These are other letters that Paul had written to other churches um, at different times. And so um, we're going to use two of those passages to kind of bring some meaning out of this verse in verse 24. And so let's get started. Verse 24 says this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Now, what were the things that Paul was um, suffering at this point? Well, he's in a Roman prison for one, and he's been in prison for three years, possibly three years at this point. Okay, He's been there a long time. He has already suffered in prison um, under Festus. Um, he was in the prison in Caesar Philippi, where um, he was just being held, not receiving justice. And so he finally appealed to Caesar. Now he's been transported. He's in a Roman prison at this point. He's writing the prison epistles at this point, which is what one of which Colossians is. And he is um, he's suffering, right? Um, and in addition to that, there's other things he suffered, right? But um, I want to take a look at what he means by this by looking at another passage that reminds me of this one in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And in that passage, Paul says this, um, so we do not lose heart. Okay, so despite the fact that we're going through all these hard things, he means we don't lose heart, though our outer self's wasting away, our inner self's being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, well, those are eternal. Okay, and so we don't lose heart despite the fact that we're going through hard things because though our outer self is wasting away, in other words, we might get physically scourged. We might get beaten, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. We might be cold and hungry, naked, cold, um, alone. We might be thirsty and not have something to drink. But though all this is happening to us um, and our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. He says, um, for this light momentary affliction, okay? And he's talking about all the things he suffers, okay? All these things he's been through. He says they're like light momentary afflictions because they're preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so if you take all the things I've suffered and put them on a scale on this side, just pile it all on, all of it, okay? And then you, on the other side of the scale, you put the eternal weight of glory that those things are preparing for us. Boom. You're just going to bottom out the scale with all the eternal weight of glory, right? It's not even a comparison. You can't even put them in the same category, okay? All the things we're suffering, they're preparing for us. They're like light momentary afflictions compared to the eternal weight of glory that those are preparing for us, as we look not to the things that are seen, so where our focus is not on the things that are seen and going on around us and physical afflictions in our bodies and, oh man, you know, I got these scars on my body now. Like, I'm not worried. My eyes aren't focused on those things. We don't focus on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, those are transient. In other words, they're, they're passing away. They, they, those things come and go. And that's one of our problems, right? We, we focus in our lives on, on the things that bring us comfort, um, uh, uh, the things that bring us joy and comfort and peace in this life, right? Um, but Paul's saying those things are transient. They come and go. But we want to hold on to them. We want to spend our lives chasing after them. And when we get them, we spend the rest of our lives trying to keep them and hold on to them. Paul's saying we don't focus on those things because those things come and go. 
there's going to be times in your life when, yes, you have good things and you have peace and you have comfort, but there's other times that are going to come that you're going to experience suffering. The things that of this world are transient. They're passing away. Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation. P Paul Peter said, don't be surprised when fire trials come upon you as though something strange were happening to you. You're going to have both, right? He says, but the things that are unseen, those things are eternal. And, and that's where we focus our lives. We we focus in, we fixate our attention and our focus and the direction, uh, the trajectory of our lives on those things that are eternal, those things that will last forever, the things that will be there in the eternal kingdom. This whole world is going to pass away, but when Christ comes, he's going to make it all new and that kingdom is eternal. So we're living for that kingdom. We're living for that time, okay? And so I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. But what does Paul mean when he says, in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church, okay? To understand this, I think we need to, to, to learn um, to see, rather, how Paul uses this same vocabulary um, in, in another context. And so in Philippians chapter 2, that's another place where Paul's using this kind of language, okay? So in Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, you see, I'm, in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. What's he mean by that? In, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul's writing a letter to the Philippians, okay? And, and the Philippians have sent him a care package with Epaphroditus, okay? So Epaphroditus brings the care package from Philippi to Paul in Rome. On the journey, he gets sick. He almost dies. He ends up being nursed back to help. He, he, health, he does make it to Rome. Paul receives the gift. He receives Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus stays there with him for a while, spends some time with him, right? And so Paul is now um, sending this letter in response. He's going to send it with, back with Epaphroditus. The Philippian church was asking, obviously, for him to send them Timothy. They love Timothy. They love Paul. This is a church that is just knit together one heart with Paul, okay? And so they're saying, we want, you, we want you to send us Timothy. We know you can't come in person, but until you do, can you send us Timothy? And Paul's writing back. He's saying, I, I can't send him just now. I can't come. I'm not able to send Timothy just now. I still have need of him, but I'm going to send you Epaphroditus. But I, want you to be, I don't want you to be disappointed when you see him, right? And so he says, I'm the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that he, that I may be less anxious. He says in verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men for he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me well what was lacking what was lacking in the Philippians church church's gift to Paul nothing this church was a church that loved Paul they loved him um, he had originally gone there because of a vision um, from of a man from Macedonia saying, you know, come and help us. And so he went, he, he, he preached the gospel there. Um, Lydia and her household, people got saved there. He began a little church. He ended up in prison there too, actually. Um, but this is a church that from the very beginning just kind of knit heart to heart with Paul. They loved him. They got him. They got his mission. They understood it and they got behind it. And so wherever Paul would go, they would send him um, ambassadors with care packages to supply his needs. They were staying in contact with him, sending him letters to encourage him, saying they believed in him. Paul, uh, um, in return, would would send them letters back as well. He would, he, When he was in the area, he would pass by. He'd stop back in and check with them and strengthen them and build them back up and spend a little minute with them and, and give them a hug and tell them he loved them. And they would tell him that they loved him. This was a, a church that loved him. And, and they had sent him this package out of their own own lack and need. And Paul, in the letter to the Philippians, even said, look, it's not that I even need the gift. I have what I need, but I just rejoice in your love for me. And so, again, what was lacking? If Paphroditus was completing what was lacking in their service to him, what was he, what were they lacking? Well, the only thing that was lacking in the Philippian church's gift to Paul was their physical presence. I mean, he's in prison. He's, he's there, like, you know, away from his, his people, from his church family, right? And it would have been a comfort for him to have them there with him, to see them face to face, to look in their eyes and see their love for him, to, 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 to receive an embrace from them, and just to have them in the same room with him. It would have been great comfort to them. But 
hey, he's like, hey, I understand you can't come. I understand it. Well, it's not that there's, you know, I get it. But um, Epaphroditus came on their behalf and he was there with Paul. He did look Paul in the eye and Paul could see his love for Paul and the Philippian church's love for Paul in the eyes of Epaphroditus. Okay. He did spend time in the same room. He embraced Paul on their behalf. And I think this gives us insight when we go back to the Colossians passage. Because Paul's saying, listen, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. The church, what's lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, nothing. He paid the full penalty for our sin. He shed sufficient, the blood, the, the, the payment in blood for the debt of our sin was paid in full. There's, there's no more that need be resupplied. Nothing can be added to what Christ did and nothing need be, or can be taken away from it. And so there's nothing lacking in that terms. But what we lack is we lack the physical presence of Christ here with us now when we can't look with our own eyes and see his affliction and his suffering for our sake but the colossian church could look and they could see the suffering of paul that's an advantage that the original disciples had right with jesus in his earthly ministry they they walked with him they talked with him they stood in the same room with him they could reach out and touch him and, and he could he could look at them and they could see his love for them in his eyes they, they watched his trial. They, they watched him scourged. They saw him carrying his cross to Calvary. They watched as the nails were driven through his hands and his feet on their behalf. And as he was lifted up, struggling to breathe on that cross as he suffered, the blood pouring down and soaking the ground, they watched that happen with their own eyes. It, it, it soaked the ground for their sin and they watched as he gave up his spirit and died for them. We can't see that same thing today. But Paul's saying, listen, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake and in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking. In other words, you can't see Christ, but you can see me and, and you can see my endurance and my patience and my joy in the midst of this suffering as I continue to press on toward the goal, as I continue to reach for the prize, for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, as, as I seek to become like him in his death, that I may by all means attain to the resurrection from the dead. You can watch my life and you can see the love of Christ for you in my eyes. And as you watch that, you can learn from me because there's going to come a day when you have to suffer as well. And you can see how to do this so that others can watch your life and they can see as you endure, as you suffer, as you struggle. They can see the glory of God in you. See, Christ is glorified in my suffering when I suffer well for him. And Christ is glorified in your suffering when you suffer well for him. People are watching our lives. They see. And he goes on to say here, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and my flesh. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. That is the church. He says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. In other words, God gave me a stewardship to care for you, to, to steward um, my influence with you, my relationship with you, and my spiritual um, authority over you, okay? To care for you, to see you brought to maturity to represent him well. And what is the stewardship that God has given you and to me in our lives? Those relationships he has put around us. It's our children, yes, but it's also our spouse. It's also our family members. It's also, uh, it's also the friends and family and coworkers that are around us that are watching our lives and they see us go through the good times, but they also watch how we suffer, okay? Do we rejoice in our suffering? for their sake, that they might, they might not be able to look and see the physical Christ. They might not be able to look and see Paul the apostle even, but they can look at us and they can see us. And as we suffer, they can look in our eyes and they can see the love of Christ for them. That's the stewardship that's given to us for them. Amen. I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. We'll move on in the next video.